Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's Biosecurity for African Swine Fever. Please note that all lines will be muted until the Q&A portion of the call. You are welcome to submit written questions during the presentation and these will be addressed during Q&A. To submit a written question, please use the chat panel on the right-hand side of your screen and choose all panelists from the send to drop-down menu. If you require technical assistance, please send a note to the event producer. With that, I'll turn the call over to Liz Fernandez. Please go ahead. Good morning, everybody, and I'd also like to thank you for joining us today for the ASF Biosecurity Webinar. Our speaker today is Dr. Pam Zabel. Dr. Zabel is an Iowa native growing up on a farm with hogs, sheep, and row crops. She earned her BS and DVM degrees from Iowa State University, and after working in a mixed animal practice for nine years, Pam accepted a position as the Director of Swine Health Information and Research at the National Pork Board. She joined the Center for Food Security and Public Health at Iowa State University in 2009 and is responsible for projects focusing on swine diseases and swine health. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Zabel. Thank you, and thank you very much for this opportunity to discuss biosecurity measures for producers in the event of an African swine fever outbreak. All right, let's get started here. So um, this morning I'm going to provide just a brief overview of African swine fever, the organism responsible, its geographic distribution, and how the disease is transmitted or spread. And these are things that I realize that many of you uh, likely already know. But I think that uh, briefly covering some of this information also sets the stage for why some of the specific um, biosecurity measures are included in the Secure Pork Supply Plan. So then I'll move on to cover some of those biosecurity measures, um, including the uh, Secure Pork Supply Biosecurity Checklist and some of the resources that we have available. So as I said, many of you probably already know that African swine fever is caused by a very large enveloped DNA virus. There are more than 20 genotypes of ASF virus um, that have been identified, and the isolates vary greatly in their virulence, with highly virulent isolates causing up to 100% mortality, um, while the lower virulent isolates may lead to only, zero, only to zero conversion. Um, all the genotypes are present in Africa, while genotypes 1 and 2 have been found outside of Africa. So some of the concern um, with this virus, it is, it is highly resistant in the environment, um, especially at lower temperatures, and in uncooked and undercooked pork and meat products. Um, it, excuse me, pork meat products. It can remain viable for long periods of time in blood, um, feces, and tissue, and can survive for several days in feces uh, at room temperature, at least a month in contaminated pig pens, and up to one and a half years in blood stored at uh, four degrees Celsius or 39 degrees Fahrenheit. The virus can also remain infectious for 150 days in boned meat um, stored at 3.9 degrees Celsius or 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, 140 days in salted dry hams, and for several years in frozen carcasses. So let's talk briefly about the species affected. Um, African swine fever, as its name suggests, uh, affects members of the pig family. Species that can be infected include domesticated swine, uh, feral pigs, Eurasia, wild boars, warthogs, bush pigs, giant forest hogs, um, it is important to note that African swine fever is not a human public health or food safety concern. So let's talk just a little bit about transmission. Transmission of the virus can occur by direct contact of susceptible animals with infected animals. Exposure is most commonly oral nasal through the saliva, ocular secretions, or nasal discharge. Um, as the virus is found in all secretions and excretions from the infected animals. It can be found in tissues, um, with the bodily fluids, especially high levels in the blood, even after the animal dies. Um, transmission can occur indirectly, such as through feeding of uncooked or undercooked pork products. And it is important to note, of course, that the Swine Health Protection Act regulates the feeding of food waste containing any meat products to swine, ensuring that it is properly treated to kill any disease organisms. Some reports also suggest that wild pigs feeding on carcasses may be important in spreading the virus.
As with many diseases, <clears throat> especially domestic diseases um, that pr our producers um, deal with every day on their sites, um, ASF can be transmitted indirectly by contaminated surfaces or fomites, such as clothing, vehicles, and equipment. Environmental contamination may result during necropsies or um, if the animals have had bloody diarrhea. Um, the virus can last for several days um, in the feces and possibly even longer in the urine. Um, aerosol transmission is believed to be limited and bites from, excuse me, bites from infected ticks um, may also spread the virus. And there was a really good presentation, a TEP presentation um, by Dr. Greg Mayer a couple months ago um, on the clinical presentation and the diagnostics um, for ASF. And I believe in his presentation he stated that in ticks um, that they can uh, be infected for up to eight years even, so um, quite a long time. And then mechanical transmission of ASF virus in flies to domestic pigs has also been demonstrated experimentally. So just a little bit about graphic, geographic distribution. Um, of course, ASF virus has never been reported in the United States, Canada, Mexico, Australia, or New Zealand. Um, it is endemic in Sub-Sahara -Sub Africa, in the island of Sardinia and feral swine. <clears throat> if you look at the map, you can see there have been several outbreaks this year. Um, China first reported in the domestic swine in August of 2018, and Belgium recently um, in their wild boar populations uh, reported in uh, September, I believe, of this year. And you can see, of course, many other countries have had ASF outbreaks. So how was the virus introduced into those countries? Um, well, the outbreaks have been linked to several factors. Uncooked or undercooked pork products fed to pigs, um, both imported and illegal. Um, raw pork waste or garbage at airports or shipping ports, again, fed to pigs. Or the movement of infected wild boars that contact domestic pigs. Um, it has been reported that the USDA has asked the Customs and Border Protection to target inspections of passengers and cargo um, coming from ASF positive regions. So a few additional risks for virus introduction. Um, <clears throat> one that we talk about quite a bit is international travel. Um, of course, that's the people themselves along with the products that they um, bring into the country, either um, naive to what the rules are or intentionally trying to bring them with them. Um, you know, we do have a couple of resources um, available. One is for um, farms that are hosting international visitors, and one is for individuals that, that travel overseas. And uh, they include some of the precautions to take, although it may be best to avoid hosting those international visitors um, if they have been on farms um, in countries that are infected with ASF. Um, a lot of great research is being done right now on feed ingredients to determine the risk of feed ingredients from countries with ASF. In addition, the risk of casings uh, being a source of infection has been discussed. And as we know, the OIE sets the guidelines for trade with countries that are ASF positive. So virus inactivation. Many common disinfectants are ineffective against the virus. Serum and feces have been found to greatly inhibit the efficacy of the disinfectants. Um, so you, clearly need to clean, um, it's very important to clean the items prior to applying the disinfectant. You can see there many um, have been reported, see on the list, to um, destroy the, the virus on non-porous surfaces. Um, unprocessed meat um, needs to be heated up to at least 70 degrees Celsius, 150 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes to inactivate the virus. Um, it can be inactivated by a pH change, um, the pH goes below 3.9 or above 11.5, um, but be aware that a higher pH is needed um, in the presence of serum to inactivate the virus, up to a pH of 13.4. A few other important considerations, um, that in domestic pigs, the morbidity can approach up to 100%. Um, the mortality 
rate, that depends on the virulence of the virus. Huge range from um, below 5% all the way up to uh, 100%. Um, any age can be affected. It may be symptomatic, asymptomatic in wild pigs, um, but be aware that survivors may become lifelong virus carriers. And of course, uh, the mortality tends to be high when ASF virus is introduced into new regions and naive herds. Um, there is, of course, no available vaccine or treatment. So, you know, as I stated earlier, the presentation by Dr. Greg Mayer, he did a really good job of covering the clinical presentation and the diagnostics for ASF. Um, that is available on the, the uh, training and exercise website. Um, and so he, I consider him the expert in those areas, so um, I defer the, um, the diagnostic. Um, I encourage you to, to look at, uh, watch his presentation, because he did a really great job talking about the ASF diagnostics. So, of course, the USDA has outlined a disease response strategy for African swine fever. Um, in that uh, document, it talks about approaches to stamping out, um, including depopulation, surveillance and investigation, quarantine and movement controls, and wildlife and management controls. So one of the, the things that we talk about when, um, when it comes to African swine fever, of course, is the quarantine and movement controls um, that will be set up in a control area. So in that control area, of course, you're going to have the sites that are infected and you're going to have the sites that show evident, no evidence of infection. So those, we're going to talk a little bit about those sites that are affected by movement restrictions but not infected um, by the African swine fever virus. So that's where the Secure Pork Supply Plan comes in. Um, it was funded by USDA in the pork checkoff. It provides guidance for an operation with no evidence of ASF infection to receive a permit to move pigs between premises and to packing plants. So again, it's for those sites in a control area that are affected by the movement restrictions, but not infected by the virus. So the plan is the result of years of collaboration between the pork industry, um, universities, states, um, USDA, and it is important to note that participation is voluntary. So this is something for those sites that um, when they are put under movement restrictions and a permit is needed, um, that those sites that, that need or want to continue to move pigs. There may be some sites out there that, um, that can sit tight for a while and, and not move animals off the premises. But um, so it is voluntary, and there are a lot of resources on the website, and there's the website at securepork.org. So now we're going to be focusing the rest of our time here on biosecurity. So biosecurity on a site is under the control of the producer. You know, every day producers are making decisions on what measures to implement on their site um, to keep out diseases like PERS, um, PED, mycoplasma. So they're making the decisions to protect their herds by keeping the disease off the farm. And that's something that, that doesn't change during an outbreak, that, um, that producers will still need to um, take measures to protect their herd as they would from endemic diseases. But what does change in the outbreak, of course, is that the regulatory officials will also be making decisions. And they'll be making decisions to protect the U.S. herd and trying to keep the disease from spreading. And those regulatory officials include local, state, federal, and tribal officials. And they'll be making decisions on issuing movement permits for those sites that are in the control area um, that have no evidence of infection. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what those measures are that producers can take to protect their herd. And there's some of these that um, producers are choosing to implement prior to an outbreak. Um, there's some that they um, have plans on implementing once we have um, African swine fever, if we have African swine fever in this country. So one thing we talk about is that routine biosecurity is not going to be enough when it comes to protecting the pigs from an ASF exposure. <clears throat> so the plan does include different biosecurity guidance. Um, here you'll see this is the uh, self-assessment checklist. So it has, I believe it's a seven-page document. Um, it has different um, measures that producers take, and then they can fill in if they're um, complete, if they're um, in progress, or if they're in place. So um, 
they can use that document. They can uh, use the information manual also available on our website. It is a larger document. Um, it, I believe, is around 45 pages. Um, it goes into more depth description. So while the checklist has the parameter that needs to be addressed and, and what the, um, the final goal is, and I'll show you some examples here, um, the information manual dives into more detail on how that might be accomplished. And then the other item that we're going to be talking about um, are the biosecurity templates. So on our website, we have um, biosecurity templates that can either be printed off and handwritten in or can be um, electronic versions that can be, the answers can be typed in. So we're going to break up those and, and their contents here in a little bit more in the presentation. So um, in the biosecurity checklist, we have several things that need to be addressed. And as I stated, we, you can mark that they're in place, in progress, or not in place kind of as a self-assessment as you go through them. But one of the first items that we talk about is the biosecurity manager and the written plan. So let's talk just a little bit about this. Um, one of the lessons learned from HiPath AI um, was that we need to make sure that the biosecurity measures on the site are being followed. So that's where the biosecurity manager comes in. The biosecurity manager needs to have a, an understanding of infectious diseases and production animal agriculture, and it, they need to be familiar with the facility. Um, they can use their um, herd veterinarian, but the important thing is to write a um, site-specific biosecurity plan. And again, they can use the templates that are provided. If they already have biosecurity plan for their site, then they need to go through their plan and make sure that the items listed in the checklist um, so again, they can use that self-assessment checklist and the information manual to write their site-specific plan. Um, the biosecurity manager is also responsible for employee training. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then making sure that the biosecurity measures that, um, that they have implemented on the site, that um, everyone is following them. There's sometimes that you may have a, say for example, someone with several sites or a company that they have a biosecurity manager that is helping the sites all write the plan um, and that they aren't actually on that site um, daily. So in those kind of cases um, where you have a biosecurity manager from multiple sites, then it is important to have someone designated as an on-site manager. Again, just to make sure that um, the biosecurity measures are being followed on the site. So um, in the biosecurity plan, um, there needs to be an explanation of how the site is meeting the measures in the checklist. And there also needs to be a site map. And here's just one example, and we're going to go through a couple others. But um, we ask that several items be labeled on the map, um, just to make sure that that, then that map could be distributed. And it makes sure that the people coming onto the site, like maybe um, the feed truck driver or someone that is delivering propane to the site, um, knows the route that they are to follow. So here's another example of what a site map might look like, um, where we have the perimeter buffer area labeled and the access points to it, the line of separation and the access points, um, where there is a C and D station, you can see at the bottom there. Um, and we'll talk about these things a little bit more, but a designated parking area for employees and visitors outside the perimeter buffer area how um, carcasses are moved around the site to be disposed of and other vehicle movements. So those are things that we ask are labeled in this site map. And again, we'll touch a little bit more on those here soon. But I want to go first to the second item on our checklist, and that is the biosecurity training. So we do have different resources that are available. Um, we have currently three uh, recorded um, narrated PowerPoints. One is on um, an introduction to biosecurity. One is on um, not bringing disease to the site. And the other one is on the perimeter buffer area. So the first one just gives employees kind of a general idea of why biosecurity is so important. Um, the second one are measures that they take at home. So for example, if they're like my family and they're avid deer hunters, that they don't wear the boots um, that they wear out hunting deer to work the next day. 
Um, of course, that would be more of a concern with foot and mouth disease or if you're in an area and, uh, and you're, maybe the employee likes to try to hunt feral swine, that sort of thing. So it's important that they understand um, how to come to the site clean and why that's important. And then the third one on the perimeter buffer area helps them understand um, what the function of the perimeter buffer area is. Right now we have a, one on the line of separation. We added a few new um, slides to it on bench entry, and that one is going to be reviewed here shortly, and then that will be up on the website. Um, we also have one ready to review on personal protective equipment, and another one that we're developing now is on um, effective cleaning and disinfecting. So there are resources um, that the sites can use to train their employees. If a site already has a, a really great biosecurity training program in place, then that's okay, they can go ahead and use that. We just ask that um, it be documented, like maybe a uh, employee sign in when they take the training and an agenda of what was discussed at the training be attached so that if an animal health official wants evidence that um, employees have been trained, that it has been documented. Um, a couple other resources, um, we do have uh, posters, laminated posters that can be hung in, uh, in production buildings on sites. Um, they're available through the pork store. And we'll talk a little bit more about that with some other resources that are available at the pork store here soon. Um, but there is a push pack that you can uh, get those included with some disease posters. So we'll move on here to the next item on the checklist, which has to do with protecting the pig herd. And under protecting the pig herd, there are several different subheadings. So we'll talk a little bit about those. Um, the first one is site entry, and one thing that we mentioned in the checklist is that the site should limit the number of entry points so that they can control what comes onto the site and be able to secure those entry points when they need to. And that there's a designated parking area away from the buildings for employee and visitors to park in um, to limit the, the risk of introducing the virus around the building. Um, the perimeter buffer area and the access points, and I'll break those out a little bit farther here in a minute, as well as the line of separation and access points. Um, and then securing the buildings, um, it states that the buildings need to be locked when no one is present on the site. So the perimeter buffer area, what is it? Well, the perimeter buffer area is around all the animal buildings serving as an outer control boundary to minimize contamination near the buildings. And so I, I should back up just for a minute and state that the resources that we have right now for secure pork and the biosecurity measures are for animals that are raised indoors. Um, we are working towards developing, um, we have some ready to review for um, a checklist for animals that are raised outside. And so those will be coming this next year. Um, we just need to have them uh, have a more extensive review process before they're ready to post to the website. Um, so the animals raised indoors, we talk about this perimeter buffer area around the buildings. And the idea is that if you can decrease the viral load around the buildings, that you can reduce the chance of introducing the virus to the susceptible animals inside the buildings. So you can enter the PBA through clearly marked and controlled PBA access points and following appropriate biosecurity measures. Um, then we'll get into the line of separation. So again, for these animals raised indoors, the walls of the building make up the line of separation. And only people and items cross into the LOS through clearly marked and controlled access points. So many times this was called the, um, the clean and dirty line but we're calling it the line of separation. It's the line of separation that separates the clean from the dirty side. Um, so when you have an employee entry, it may be that you have a shower in, shower out, um, or you may have them wash hands. We don't specifically state in the uh, plan that you have to have showers. If they're available, you need to use them. Um, also have, uh, again, employees washing their hands. Changing into site-specific coveralls or clothing and footwear for the site, having your LOS lines clearly marked. And uh, then we talk about items coming in to equipment and supplies. Um, and, and we don't specify, again, it could be a matter of, of cleaning and disinfecting, fumigation. It could be, um, I know some sites are looking at ultraviolet light for different things. It could be double packaging and that, um, that the outer box is opened on the dirty side and the contents are dumped 
in the inner box to someone on the clean side of the of the LOS, um, if those are known to come from a, a clean known source. So we do have different options, and it can be um, the plans can be developed according to what works best on that site. So here we have an example of what it might look like. Um, for a site, and this would be one with enclosed walkways that you can see the red line there um, serves as the, the line of separation. Um, you can see the LOS access points. We have one there in the employee building. That would be the only employee entrance to the site. Um, it may be, again, shower out, shower in, shower out, um, bench entry, but changing into site-specific coveralls or clothing and footwear, washing hands or showering. Um, we have LOS access points at the front of the buildings there for the animal loadout in this case. Um, and depending how the site handles their mortality, it may be that the, um, the animals, the dead animals are handled out the back of the, the uh, buildings um, or the front of the buildings depending on how they're handled on that site. Um, it's up to the site as long as they do it in a biosecure manner. Um, but you can see there that the parking is outside the perimeter buffer area. If you include the parking inside the perimeter buffer area, again, we talk about things entering the perimeter buffer area would need to be um, clean and disinfected. And so um, the C&D station we have in this example on the left side there in case they need to take something like maybe a skid loader or a tractor um, inside the perimeter buffer area. But in this case, we um, it is it is drawn so that the feed trucks can stay outside the perimeter buffer area and still um, auger the feed over into the feed bins. And so again, where these lines are drawn depends on um, a lot of factors. It may depend on the level of risk, the layout of the site. It could depend on um, your ability to um, have enough water or to, if you're in a state that you need to capture the water that you use at a C&D station. And so it may be difficult to see and D every single thing coming on the site, whereas if you can keep people outside the perimeter buffer area um, and still maintain a, a decreased viral load around the buildings, that may be something that you decide for that site. Here's another example. In this example, the buildings do not have a walkway, an enclosed walkway. They're four separate buildings. And so in this example, we added an employee building at the top there, which would be something like a garden shed with two doors though. So employees could come in to one door, again, um, wash hands, change into site-specific coveralls, clothing, footwear, um, cross over maybe a bench entry, come into the perimeter buffer area and be able to walk um, between those buildings. Granted, there's still a risk, of course, of virus being in the perimeter buffer area. Um, and so when they enter into a finishing building in this example, and they cross that line of separation, it would be a matter of changing footwear at that point. Um, you know, there's not a lot of room in these buildings when you go in um, to be able to do a lot of other things. You could maybe install a small sink if you so chose um, that drained into the pit to be able to wash hands too. Um, but the, the line of separation um, and changing the boots would kind of serve like what the foot baths um, used to do, and some sites really struggle with um, maintaining those foot baths so that the um, so that they're effective. And so that's why instead of having um, foot baths instead or boot baths, instead it's um, a line of separation and a changing of footwear as you enter those buildings. Again, just some examples of how it could be drawn um, on different sites. So now we're going to go ahead and move on to vehicles and equipment. And for vehicles and equipment, we talk about those that are not hauling animals or the animal transport vehicles. So what we've talked in the checklist is that uh, vehicles and equipment that need to be disinfected prior to entering, again, that perimeter buffer area, trying to decrease that viral load around the building. And those hauling animals to the site should have been cleaned before the animals were loaded for delivery. Let's talk a little bit about personnel. So a few things for personnel. We talk again in that training video about what to do prior to arriving at the site to make sure that um, that if the employees have other susceptible animals at home, that after they do chores, that they um, need to shower, change into clean clothing and footwear before coming to the site. Um, if, if different sites have a policy um, that the employees are not allowed to own animals at home, then that's 
that is a decision that they can make. Um, but we do ask that they, um, if they've had uh, any possible contact with any susceptible animals, that they come to the site having showered, wearing clean clothing and footwear. And then sites need to maintain a visitor log or an entry log book. And then we talk a little bit more about the biosecure entry procedures um, that we've covered a little bit as they cross the LOS access point or the PBA access point. Okay, so moving on to animals and semen movement. A few things that are covered um, in that section are the incoming animals and semen and that they need to come from sources with documented enhanced biosecurity practices and the animals need to have no evidence of African swine fever infection. We ask that sites have a contingency plan and in case there is a a period of uh, stop movement, um, and what are they going to do um, with managing um, animals on the site in a biosecure manner if movement is stopped for a period of time. And then um, we also address the loading of animals, and that, that needs to occur only in one direction. So as animals, for example, are loaded out onto the truck that they don't turn around and go back into the building. If a breach does occur um, during the loading and loading process um, that the areas contaminated need to be cleaned and disinfected. One thing that you'll notice I skipped there is the pre-movement isolation period. And I wanted to talk about that separately because we have a graphic here that explains it a little bit better. Um, so granted in this graph, if, if you look to the left there, we have FMD in the example, but it also goes for African swine fever. And the Secure Pork Supply Plan also covers classical swine fever. So the FMD could be either, in this example, CSF or ASF. So the idea here in the top example is that this operation needs to move animals off-site. And so prior to moving animals, seven days prior, they do not bring any incoming animals from a control area onto that site for seven days prior. Um, and that ensures that you're not bringing new disease onto the site and then the animals can move next stage of production. Now in the second, if you're receiving animals, same thing applies. It would be that animals coming in from a control area under a movement permit and showing no evidence of infection upon moving come to the operation and after they arrive, no animals are loaded out for a minimum of seven days. Again, um, just to make sure that those animals are not going to um, infect the site and that, that uh, the site stays negative before animals are moved to the next stage of production. So that's what the pre-movement isolation period is. We're going to talk here briefly about carcass disposal. In the plan, we don't talk about um, specific measures that, um, as far as which method of disposal needs to take place. We don't state that it has to be incineration or it has to be composting. What we do say is that dead animals need to be disposed of in a manner that prevents the attraction of wildlife, rodents, and other scavengers. And we also state that rendering trucks and other vehicles hauling dead animals to a common disposal site do not enter the PBA. Um, I do know that as sites are talking with the animal health officials in their state, that some of the animal health officials are asking the sites to look at disposal options nearby to reduce the risk of carrying disease back to the site. So do they have um, ground, enough ground around the site to maybe do composting? Do they have a relationship with the owner of ground around the site? Um, that they may be able to utilize that ground if they need to. Um, one of the reasons that we didn't specify in the plan is that there are a lot of laws that vary state by state. You know, if, as many of you know, um, some states burial may not be an option, but it may be in others. Um, incineration is not an option in some state, but in others. And, and the question becomes for your animal health official too, um, is that, uh, is rendering going to be allowed? Um, so are animals, um, are you gonna be able to move animals off the site to be rendered? So these are questions that we're asking producers to talk to their state animal health officials. So while um, the Secure Pork Supply Plan has been developed on a national level, there are a lot of things that are uh, site specific that do need to happen at, at the state level. Uh, discussions need to take place with the, the state animal health officials. Very important. Another one of those discussions, again, that need to occur at the state level um, 
are, uh, are those around manure management. Um, so the SPS plan states that producers need to have a plan on how to store manure on site if it cannot be permitted to move off site during an outbreak. And I realize that that is an extremely difficult thing to do, um, that if pits are full and need to be emptied, that there are not a lot of options to store it on the site. Um, but that is, is one concern that uh, we do not spread the disease around <clears throat> through the manure and that uh, manure is a permitted movement. It, it, it has to move under a, a movement permit. Um, and in addition, the manure needs to be stored and removed in a manner that prevents exposure of susceptible animals and needs to meet state, local, and regulatory um, officials' requirements. So concerning rodent wildlife and other animals, um, we do include in the plan that a rodent in fly control problem need, excuse me, rodent in fly control program uh, need to be in place and that the facilities need to be able to keep out animals like dogs. Um, we have deer commonly there on our place and feral swine um, from entering the buildings. So that's very important from a disease control standpoint. And the final thing on the um, fast security checklist um, is feed. And currently what we have in the plan is that grain and feed should be delivered, stored, mixed, and fed in a manner that minimizes contamination and that feed spills need to be cleaned up promptly and disposed of to avoid attracting wildlife. So now that said, again, I know that there is um, a lot of discussion around feed at this point. And this is, uh, for those of you who don't know, this is a um, decision tree matrix to minimize the viral transmission risk from feed ingredients. And this is on the pork.org website. And I just want to state that there's a lot of research being done in relation to the survival of ASF virus and the feed ingredients. Um, and again, this is the decision tree. And here's some different things I know that, um, that they're looking at. I got this slide from um, someone at, at the National Pork Board. And the research um, at this time shows certain feedstuffs could support viral survival, but no feedstuffs have actually been found to be contaminated. Um, that no transmission through feed has been demonstrated experimentally or naturally. And again, there's still more studies ongoing. There's not a validated testing or sampling scheme. Um, but again, some of that's being looked at. If testing is done using non-validated um, tests, what do, what do those results mean? And so that's something that we need the validated testing for. And again, check off is looking at mitigation steps. So. And, and a, a holding time for the different um, feed ingredients. So again, this is not my area of expertise, but my point in bringing this up is that, um, and in other areas too, that, that there is research that is being done and that if, uh, if the science shows us that we need to um, change some of our biosecurity guidelines, then that is something that we do. We consider the biosecurity checklist as being a, a working draft and that as science directs us in, uh, in ways to update that to help protect sites more um, effectively against African swine fever and FMD and CSF, then those changes will be made. That in no way do we consider that being a, a final draft. And also along those same exact lines is there are some risk assessments that are being performed and have been uh, conducted by the University of Minnesota. And they're um, being done to help promote that business continuity side and help to develop and, and evaluate mitigation measures. So they've looked at the um, biosecurity measures that are included in the checklist. And then um, they have some of the risk assessments that have been completed. They're going through what some of the recommendations are um, with their working group, and we may see some changes to the biosecurity checklist based on what they find with these assessments. So I just want to bring that to your attention that, um, again, the checklist we don't consider is final, that it may change based on, um, on what they're finding with these risk assessments and, and with additional um, research that's being done out there. So that's a very important thing to note. Um, I told you that I would mention just a little bit about the information manual. Again, it's like a, um, I believe it's like 45 pages. You can see the way it's formatted there is in the box. 
um, is what is included in the checklist, and then underneath it there are paragraphs um, explaining options and, and adding more information to help clarify exactly um, what is being asked in the checklist. We were asked to have the checklist try to be um, short and succinct, and so, um, but we finally get a lot of questions about different parts of the checklist exactly as meant, and so that's um, expanded upon in the information manual. And I just want to give you just a look here at what um, producers see when they go to the website. Um, so if they click up there on the pork producer tab, um, you see different items there on the left, and the one circled is biosecurity. And then there are many resources here on the biosecurity page. And we're still um, developing others and, and adding more, so um, it is still building um, the, on the website. Um, but you can see here the arrow is the checklist, and that's how you find the checklist. I believe under that arrow is the biosecurity manual to the right there of the checklist. Um, if you go down a little farther there on the page, you can see that the, the templates um, are there on the left. And again, there's some signage, there's some other biosecurity forms, um, information on how to create a premises map, um, other different resources on biosecurity. Now, realizing the talk today was on biosecurity, but you can see there also, um, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that there's a lot of resources there on disease monitoring. Um, for producers, we talk about movement records. There's some forms and SOP. If you look there to your right, um, I don't have it circled, but there's training materials. So you can look under there. Um, that's where the biosecurity um, training videos are located. Um, and also you can see there's a tab there for regulatory officials, also um, veterinarians and packers. So if you go under regulatory officials, we have a segment there on um, disease information. And so um, we have a lot of resources for FMD, CSF, and ASF, including OIE, um, USDA resources. So if you see that there's something missing there that you think would be helpful, um, please let me know. Um, a lot of the veterinarian information for those veterinarians on the line, um, brings you back to the producers because so much of it is how you're going to help those producers implement um, the secure pork measures on their site. So here are some additional resources. Um, there's a fact sheet, the USDA disease response strategy, there's the link to that, um, the OIE information, um, and then also, again, I want to highlight the training and exercise program video gallery. Um, that's where you could locate the uh, video that I mentioned of Dr. Greg Mayer on the um, ASF clinical presentation and diagnostics. There's also a recording there from um, Dr. Jim Roth from a couple weeks ago on the ASF phases and types. And I know, uh, I believe it was earlier this year, maybe spring, that Jan Archer gave a really good overview of the swine industry. Um, for those that want to watch that and have a, a better understanding of why um, animal movement is so important in the wine industry and how it operates. So just a few references that I had used um, in our presentation today, and um, I'm happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, as of right now, we don't have any written questions. Are there any uh, verbal questions in the queue? Ladies and gentlemen, as we move to Q&A, please press pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. You will hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please then state your name and question. Once again, pressing pound two will indicate that you wish to ask a question. To submit your written question, please use the chat panel on the right-hand side of your screen and choose all panelists from the Send to drop-down menu. Thank you. Hey, we do have a couple written questions that just came in. Um, one of them is, what is the link to the Secure Pork Supply? Okay, so the website is securepork.org. Secure and um, if you have any questions or want any information, you can go to the Contact Us on the securepork.org website. And you're also welcome to um, email me at zabelp at iastate.edu, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or help you find additional information. Next question is, um, how do you change the pH level in pork? That would be out of my area of expertise. 
I don't know. Um, we have Dr. John Korslund with USDA APHIS Veterinary Services on the line. I don't know if there's any information he can provide or uh, I apologize. Yeah, good morning. No, I, I'm afraid I'd have to um, plead ignorance on that also when you talk about pork itself. Um, that's, that's a question we can certainly look up and try and find an answer, but I don't, at the top of my head, I don't know what that would be. There's another written question. This is how would you cook bacon for 30 minutes? Is there some kind of reference to that? Um, <laughs> Again, we're, we're out of my area of expertise here, but considering that bacon is is treated, um, is handled differently, I I, I, get, I can't answer that. I'm I'm out of my uh, comfort zone here. Okay, there's another one that came out, and it says, um, I apologize if I missed it, but who has the authority to approve a site's biosecurity plan for the secure pork supply? Okay, so um, there's a few things along those lines that we're talking about. Um, one is that um, right now there are some states that are working with producers to write um, site-specific biosecurity plans. So that would be something that the, um, the state animal health official would work through. I know on the um, poultry side that that is something that the, um, the National Poultry Improvement Plan um, individuals help look through those sites. So it's something that's on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, one thing that we're starting to kind of look through, an option possibly might be to include it as a um, an item in the Port Quality Assurance Plus program. So if it would be um, acceptable to state animal health officials um, to have the accredited veterinarians that act as PQA advisors approve those plans, um, that's something that the discussions need to take place. Some states may choose, um, the state animal health official may choose that they want to be the ones and someone in their office to look through those plans and approve those plans. Other states may determine that um, with the number of sites located in their state that that is not an option and, and may um, be open to having um, accredited vets review those. So, so that's a very good question. Um, that is something that um, that we're still working through and discussing. But right now, it's a matter that if um, if the state animal health officials want to um, look through those plans. Okay. So the next question is: Has a risk assessment been done for manure management? Um, not to my knowledge, uh, Dr. Korslin. Are you aware of any? No, I'm not. That's that's a good question. I mean, we're in kind of in our infancy in a lot of research related to ASF, uh, referring back to the, uh, the cooking time on bacon and so on. It probably is the same situation where um, we've got time for uh, inactivation of virus based on you know some gross studies, but to get into the details, whether it's manure management or pork cooking times or whatever, there's just a, a host of research that's going to need to happen as we uh, keep approaching this problem. Okay, the next question is, um, you mentioned an outdoor production plan is in process. Is there a timeline on that? And in the interim, what can producers raising pigs outdoors begin doing? So um, right now, well, the timeline, good question, first of all, good, very good question. The timeline is um, a few months ago <laughs> would be what, what we would hope. We have, um, we have some draft documents. And we'd like to, as soon as the first of the year, get those in front of a working group for them to start um, evaluating. And so I would hope that within the next few months we would have those available on the website. Um, one thing I kind of envision, and, and again, I can't anticipate what the working group, the feedback that they will give, um, but one thing that we've included in our draft, if you go to securebeef.org, um, you can look at the Secure Beef Supply Plan, and they do have resources on there um, for animals raised on pasture. And so um, I see that as being somewhat of our starting point um, because if, if uh, beef animals are moving under those conditions, um, is that something that would also apply to hogs that are raised out on pasture? So I see that kind of as being our starting point that producers could start to look at um, what the guidelines are on the biosecurity side for for cattle out on pasture, 
realizing that on the pork side that um, that the uh, those reviewing and editing the documents may make some changes, of course, but that would be a good starting point. Okay, so the next question is, is there research showing that disinfection of tires is effective or is it more PR? And how effective is disinfection in setting up vehicle cleaning in the middle of winter? And will this lead to it not being implemented? Good question. So some of the things that we talk about in having a contingency plan in place is if we are um, in the middle of a cold snap in Iowa and it's impossible to clean tires, what other options do you have on that site? Maybe you have somewhere nearby, maybe you're in, a, in an area where it's not as swine dense and you could uh, traffic your vehicle after it was um, cleaned and disinfected at another location and, and manage your routes to the site to ensure that there wasn't cross traffic um, with possible infected vehicles. Um, and then I want to also point out, and I do appreciate this question because it brings up the point that this next year, we're going to have a meeting um, with those individuals that have been working towards implementation on these sites, talking through um, what they're finding is extremely difficult to implement, and um, if there's other options um, that we could entertain, and um, what the animal health officials would, um, if they would agree to those other options. So those are good points that are raised. Um, again, in the plan right now, we do encourage a contingency plan um, because we do understand that under cold temperatures and so on that a C&D station um, may not be doable. And so we, we are going to have those discussions. And again, like I said, this is a, a, draft, um, a draft plan, and so um, I do uh, envision it being updated according to the feedback we receive. So thank you for that question. The next question is, since ASF is an envelope virus, shouldn't thorough cleaning with detergent be effective in inactivating the virus prior to applying a disinfectant on premises? I wish I were a CND expert. Um, I, that's a, I, I don't know, I guess, aside from the fact that we see some of these disinfectants that aren't effective. Um, so I don't know that, that cleaning alone would do it if some of these disinfectants aren't um, able to do the job. Dr. Korslin, do you have a better answer? I, I, again, am not a real expert in that either. Some of the folks in the emergency management site probably could answer that better than me, but I think in general, we all, it's pretty much standard um, recommendations is cleaning is always important for every virus and maybe even more so for the envelope ones, but the, the idea that uh, you can somehow disinfect around uh, gross organic material just isn't probably going to work. So um, regardless of whether what disinfectant you may have to use in the end, the, the cleaning and washing is really important, uh, particularly for, well, for all viruses, but ASF included. Question is, do tick species present in the U.S. slash North America currently transmit the virus? So that's a good question, and I believe that came up on um, one of the other presentations um, addressing ASF. And uh, I think that the answer, and again, I believe that this is what I heard the answer was, that there are two tick species in the United States that could. Okay. The next question is, what committees or work groups could, interest, could interested parties participate on in the Center for Food Security and Public Health of the Secure Pork Supply Organization? So if anyone has any interest in, in providing some feedback, it would be great if you would um, go to the Secure Pork website, again, at securepork.org, go to the Contact Us, and give me your information. That uh, comes directly to me, and then I can... Uh, I can reach out to you and we can discuss where your interests and fit might best be served. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I know we don't have any um, written questions in the queue. Are there any verbal questions in the queue? There are currently no verbal questions in the queue. Okay, well, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, 
If you have any additional questions, please feel free to either contact Pam or myself. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone for joining us. We had over 300 people on the line, so that's a great, uh, great thing. Uh, be sure to watch your email as we have a webinar on the secure beef supply, a safe perspective on January 16th at 1 p.m. And we are working on a few additional webinar dates, so watch your email for the announcements. And with that, we'll close today's um, webinar, and I hope everyone has a happy holiday. Thank you for joining today's presentation. The event has now concluded, and you may disconnect.